All right, so the next step then is to select uh, the direction, and we do this randomly as well. So here's my location. Now I've got to select the direction to, uh, to shoot the ray off in. It's going to be uh, selected based on these two polar coordinates, theta and phi, right? And here, I, again, I have to be careful because it's really easy to think, well, I'll just choose theta to be uniformly distributed between 0 and 90 degrees, and I'll just choose phi to be uniformly distributed between 0 and, and 360 degrees, or 2 pi. Um, and that would be fine for theta, right? But it wouldn't be okay for, uh, I'm sorry, that would be fine for phi. That would not be okay for theta. And the reason is because I need to have uh, an equal probability of hitting every area of a hemisphere that's placed over this origin, right? And so, you know, if I uniformly choose a, an angle theta between 0 and 90 degrees, I'm doing kind of the same thing I just described before, which is I'm concentrating my rays artificially towards the top of this hemisphere, and I'm going to have a very sparse distribution of rays down here towards the bottom of the hemisphere where the, where the area is bigger. In other words, an equal amount of angle theta is going to have a much smaller area up here towards the top of the hemisphere than it is down here towards the bottom. And so the right way you do that is shown here, right? So phi is uniformly distributed, so this p is going to be a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Phi is uniformly distributed between 0 and 2 pi, and that's fine, right? Because every, every value of, of phi between 0 and 2 pi has an equal area on this hemisphere. Theta, though, you have to choose with this, with this equation here. So this p is a uniform number between 0 and 1, but then I take the square root of it and the arc sine of it, and that gives me theta. And that's <coughs> probably not obvious where this comes from, but it would be obvious if you sat down and said, you know, rather than doing this on a uniform basis per angle, I'm going to do it on a uniform basis per area. And if you, if you go through that process, you'll get this equation right here. So this is how I'm going to choose phi and theta. And so if you go back to my MATLAB code, you should see that right here. Right, This rand is what I'm using here for p theta. And this rand is what I'm using here for phi. Right, Every time uh, MATLAB encounters this rand function, it generates a new random number. So just to be clear, this rand and this rand and this rand and this rand, they're all different numbers. Right, It's being generated. So now I have my direction, um, so that's good. And the next thing I have to do now is keep track of where the ray goes, right? And this can be the hardest part of the problem, depending on the geometry. Um, I think the easiest way to do this is to recognize that um, you know, when I shoot this, this ray off and choose a direction, I've basically um, defined a unit vector, right? I've defined a unit vector, I've given it an origin, and I've given it a, a, a direction. And if I want to keep track of what happens to the tip of this unit vector, I just have to multiply uh, the unit vector uh, by a length and make that length grow. And I can see the trajectory of the ray, right? So the unit vector um, is given by this equation right here. And uh, let's see, the unit vector has a, 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 it's a unit vector, right? So it has a length of one. So if I want to find the projection of this unit vector under the z-axis, well, let's see, this is, this is theta, it would be cosine of theta, right? So the unit vector's z-coordinate is cosine of theta. If I want to find the projection of this unit vector onto the x or the y-axis, the first thing i got to do is project it down onto the xy-plane. Right? So this distance here is going to be um, 1 multiplied by the sine of theta, right? So that's this projection here. And then if I want to project that onto the x-axis, then I would take... Uh, the sine of theta and multiply it by the cosine of phi, because that's this angle here. If I want to project it on the y-axis, I take the sine of theta and multiply it by the sine of phi, right? So the x-coordinate of this unit vector is, let's see, it's, uh, it's sine of theta times cosine of phi. It's this thing right here, which is what I'm multiplying i by. And then the uh, y-coordinate is sine of phi times sine of theta. So this is, this is the um, coordinates of this unit vector. This is where the tip of this unit vector lies. And if I want this unit vector to, to fly through space, I just multiply this whole thing by L, right? So that's what I did here. I said that uh, the, the, tip of this, the tip of this unit vector 
is defined as the initial coordinate of the unit vector, right? So that's what x naught, y naught, and z naught are. And then I take the unit vector itself and I multiply it by L. So if L is zero, if the length of the vector is zero, then I'm just gonna get my uh, launching point, right? I just start right here. Uh, as L grows, then what happens? Well, then uh, I'm gonna shoot this off through space, right? And that's what, that's what I've done here. So X naught, X naught, plus L times uh, the X coordinate of the unit vector. So L times cosine of phi times sine of theta. This is Y naught, right? And then I'm, I'm multiplying L by sine of phi times sine of theta. So that's what this is here. And then this is Z naught, Z naught times L times cosine of theta. So this set of coordinates is going to define the trajectory of my, of my ray as it moves through space, right? L goes from zero to infinity as this ray moves um, through, its, through its life. And I just have to decide then based on that, um, where in its path does it strike another surface, right? So that's, you know, a very problem-specific thing, right? This is, this is a much more general equation that you can use regardless of what's going on, but, but now I have to decide, okay, how do I decide whether this path is going to intersect something else? And in this case, it's pretty obvious, I think, right? Um, this ray is going to fly through space, the only other surface in space is in this uh, y equals zero plane. So I just got to decide when does this ray um, intersect the y equals zero plane. And once it intersects that plane, does it hit this little square or does it miss that square, right? So let's see. Y equals zero is, uh, is this equation right here. So this is the y coordinate. If I set this y coordinate equal to zero, I'll get the length of the ray at the point where it intersects the y equals zero plane, right? So that's what I did right here. I said this uh, y coordinate is equal to zero, so the length is, is this right here, and I can calculate that. <clears throat> and then I can take this length and substitute it back into this equation and this equation, and it'll give me the x coordinate and the z coordinate, so the x coordinate and the z co coordinate, uh, at which this intersection occurs, right? So that's the last thing I did is I took, uh, I took this equation and I can substitute it into this part. And I took this equation, I can substitute it into this part, and that's giving me the x intersection and the z intersection point, right? And if I sort of look back at this equation, now it's just a matter of deciding, you know, does the x intersection and the z intersection point on this plane lie within this shaded area, right? So if we just sort of look at the uh, x, z plane from above, um, I'm, I'm deciding basically, does the x intersection point lie between zero and C, and the y intersection point lie between B1 and B1 plus B2, right? If both of those things are true, then I hit. <coughs> Otherwise, I miss, right? And so, oops. So let's go back and look at the MATLAB code. So here, uh, here's my, my length at which the, uh, the ray will intersect the y equals zero plane. And then uh, here's my x intersection point and my z intersection point. And then this is just a little bit of logic to decide whether or not my hit counter should be incremented or not, right? So uh, if x is less than zero, no, right? If x is greater than c, no, and so on and so forth. Um, if none of these things are true, then yes, right? Then absolutely I've hit, and, and so then I increment my hit counter. And I run this over and over again, and after I get done running it, uh, my view factor, my best estimate of the view factor is the number of hits divided by n. So hopefully that's pretty clear. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward, at least in terms of uh, the idea of it. The geometry of it can be a little sketchy, right? You have to sort of work your way through that. But let's, let's see how this works. So here I just picked um, a geometry, uh, a equal 1, b1 and b2 and c. And now I'm just going to run this thing. So let's set end a small number like 10. And I'll run my, uh, my function. And what you'll see is, uh, so that time my view factor is 0.2, which means that two of my 10 rays hit it. But if I run it again, that time none of my 10 rays hit it. This time three of my 10 rays hit it, right? So every time I run it, I'm going to get a different answer. And, um, you know, you really have to understand that in order for this to be useful, n can't be 10. n's got to be like, 
I don't know, let's say 100,000 or something like that. So now when I run it, I get uh, 0.14, right? And 0.1408. So I'm still getting slightly different answers, but the variation is out here in like the third decimal point this time, right? And that's, you know, maybe that's good enough. I'm starting to get uh, a better feel that on average about 14% of these rays are going to hit. So the V factor is right around 0.14, right? The way that you do this better, and by this I mean find out how many rays you need, is you would actually um, do something like this. So here I've set up a vector that has uh, the number of rays that I shoot off, going from 10 all the way up to, I guess, 100,000, right? And each time I do this, uh, I'm going to shoot off 20 rays, and I'm going to take the mean of those, um, those rays, those 20... Um, uh, those 20 runs and call that my view factor and then I'm going to take the standard deviation of those 20 runs and call that my view factor deviation and so now I can make a plot after I run this uh, where I where I plot the mean view factor and then I put an error bar around that mean view factor that's equal to the standard deviation I get when I run it over and over again and the the output of that is shown here so here's my um, Here's my output of that. This is the number of rays. The red dots are the mean uh, value that I get each time I run it, right? And you can see that as I go to more and more rays, the, the mean value goes to some uh, constant value. And then the error bars are the standard deviation. And you can see that they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So depending on what kind of accuracy I need, you know, 10,000 to 100,000 is probably a good number. Um, just to be clear, you know, this is a view factor that's in the library. It's an easy one, right? So I can run the view factor library and make sure that uh, under those conditions, which is this blue line right here, my, my Monte Carlo method is going to the actual uh, view factor, right? So, you know, once you get your Monte Carlo put together, it's really nice if you can find a limiting case to, to run it in uh, where you have an analytical solution for a view factor and make sure it works there, right? So that's you know, exactly the same as with a numerical technique where you have this very flexible numerical technique and one of the first things you're going to want to do is dumb it down to the point where you can compare it to an analytical solution to make sure that it's working, right? And once I see that it's working here, well now I can go back and do things uh, like put holes in these surfaces or, you know, whatever else I want to do to make them complicated that I couldn't, you know, use a, uh, couldn't use a, a view factor library function for. All right, so that's the idea between behind view factors with the Monte Carlo technique, and that's actually kind of it uh, for radiation and for and for the class. So um, yeah.